Hey everyone, happy Friday. I'm Phil Hodgen and welcome to the Hodgen Law PC International Tax Lunch. We do this every month on the last Friday of the month at noon Pacific time. You can listen in online through CalCPA, which is what you're doing right now, or we throw it up on the YouTube later so you can watch it there if you want to. This month's topic is the nine categories, filing categories of Form 5471. So once upon a time, there were five filing categories, and then one of them fell off, and there were four because one was no longer used. And then there was one again, so they revived it in, with the 2017 Tax Act, and there were five. And now this year on the Form 5471, if you've looked at it, there are nine. So this is gruesome, and this is just a high-level overview of what those nine filing categories mean and how you know in a general way whether the taxpayer that you're working on a tax return for fits in one or more of those. The speaker is moi, Phil Hodgen, and you can find out more about all of us at hodgen.com. Uh, if you have a question, throw it in the box. I'm not looking at the questions during the presentation. Rachel should be grabbing those, I hope. And if not, my email address is on the final slide in this deck. Grab it and ping me emails. Uh, so no Q&A during the session. But with that, let's get going. Part one, introduction. All right. So this is where we are looking, Form 5471 and that little thing right there. And it's kind of funny, isn't it, that you have one little item with just a few check boxes and we can fill an hour talking about that, which sort of gives, I, I just, of all the tax forms I dislike, I dislike this one the most. Let me just say, it's the weirdest, the most complicated. The opportunities for brain damage are just endless with Form 5471. So it gets some kind of prize. But let's start here. And so, you know, you just saw what the boxes look like and they look all like boxes on a form. But this is the evolution from last year to this year, from the previous version of Form 5471 to the current version of Form 5471, which is a uh, December 2020 revision. So what you can see here is that for categories two, three, and four, they're the same as they always were. So nothing has changed for those categories, but for categories one and category five, for those two, there are changes where one became three. And the high level thought I want you to carry along all the way through is we'll, we'll deal with um, categories one and five at the end with those red ones is those are the red ones are the new ones. And the reason they exist is because at the end of 2017, Congress repealed Internal Revenue Code Section 958B4. And we were visited with the curse of downward attribution. And this created situations where a U.S. taxpayer might become a U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation secretly behind their back because of attribution through foreign entities. So RevProc 2019-40 attempted to deal with problems faced by people like that who sort of got sideswiped by down, downward attribution. And 1B and 1C were added and 5B and 5C were added to reduce the amount of information requirement, you know, the, those, the schedules that you have to fill in for Form 5471 be, on the theory that these people might not have access to all the data that they need because of these suddenly controlled foreign corporations. So that's what it looks like. Um, and so once you boil it down and you say, oh, really, the, we have four new ones just because of one thing, and we can go to RevProc 2019-40 to find all the lovely details, it becomes a lot less overwhelming. Nevertheless, the whole thing about filing status and checking which box is important and all 
is, is just a super, super, super basic and important thing that you've got to work on for Form 5471 projects, just because the different filing categories spawn different information requirements. So I've just given an excerpt of the top of the table from page five of the instructions that shows if you're in this category, these are the schedules that you have to file and stuff like that. And there's more down below it. I just snipped it off because it looked prettier that way. And if you F it up, the penalties are substantial. And if you F it up and you're the preparer, the client reasonably is going to be looking to you to write the check for $10,000 or more to the IRS. So it's important to get this right. So what do you need to know in order to answer the item B? Well, let's look at these. There, there are some a bunch of defined terms, and here we are, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in the future slides. But the first thing that you need to know is, is the taxpayer a U.S. person? That's a defined term in the code. Is the taxpayer a U.S. shareholder? That's also a defined term. U.S. person applies for all of the categories. U.S. shareholder only applies for the three, the categories in one and five, because those specifically in, as part of the filing, are you one of them? You know, are you a category one filer or a category five filer? Then you say, am I a shareholder of what? First, you got to figure out, is it a corporation? Then you have to figure out, is it a foreign corporation? And then you got to figure out, is it a specified foreign corporation? That's category one or a controlled foreign corporation. And that's category one, as well as category five. And then, you know, for those new check the boxes, 1B, 1C, 5B, 5C, all spawned by RevProc 2019-40, there are a bunch of fiddly definitions there that you have to understand in order to figure out whether you fall into one of those categories. And I'll deal with the fiddly definitions later when we come to it. So let's, but let's look at the ones that are sort of consistent across all. First, let's talk about what the shareholder. So when you're preparing a form 5471, the first thing you need to know is, is this person a U.S. person? So U.S. taxpayer. And it applies across all five of the categories, or nine, depending if you want to treat subcategories as categories. And either explicitly, because categories two, three, and four call for, are you a U.S. shareholder in a blank? Uh, whereas categories one and five say, are you a U? pardon me, two, three, and four just say, are you a U.S. person? with relationship to that foreign corporation. Whereas categories one and five say, are you a US shareholder? And part of being a US shareholder is being that US adjective in front of it, you're a US person. So we're going to import the standard definition in section 7701A30. So that's gonna come, but there are going to be some modifications and I'll flag those. So US person, is slightly broader for this purpose, you know, figuring filing status for 5471 than it would be in the ordinary context of filing a tax return. Here are the standard definitions, nothing remarkable there from Form 70, uh, Internal Revenue Code Section 7701A30. It's all the kind of things that you would expect. Next, so we've got a US person Let's just assume it hypothetically. Now we have to ask, is this person a U.S. shareholder? And there's a standard definition in the code, and we'll come to it in a second. And this matters for categories one and categories five, the ABC in both, all three of those. It doesn't matter for categories two, three, and four, because the only thing that matters for categories two, three, and four is whether you have a U.S. person in the picture. Here's the normal definition of United States shareholder. I've flagged the important part. Say, hey, do you have 10% or more by voter value of the stock of a foreign corporation? So that's the kind of the guidepost here for 10% or more. So having done that, we've, so we've got a U.S. person and we have a U.S. shareholder. Let's say you've gone through all of that, you've figured it out, which is not necessarily an easy thing. 
um, especially the U.S. shareholder thing. And do you have 10 percent? Because that's a question of attribution rules and indirect ownership and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, shameless marketing plug. Next month, I'm going to be spending a whole hour talking just about constructive ownership and attribution rules in the context of Form 5471. So I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about the nerd-like details of constructive ownership this month, We're, but next month we will. So, so you've got a shareholder of some kind, but a sh a, you know, this U.S. person owns what? Well, in the, it's got to be a corporation, first of all. And this slide just tells you, don't blindly look at the initials and assume, well, at the end of it, it says Inc or SA or limited or something like that. That's not definitive in terms of US tax classification. What you're gonna do is there's a, a list of foreign entities, and I give you the citation to the regs there that say, these are always classified as corporations for US tax purposes. So if you have one of those, then you know you've got a corporation end of story and you can move on to the next step. If you don't, you're going to look at the entity classification rules in that third bullet point, and I give you the citation there. And it says, if you've got an eligible foreign entity, by default, it's going to be classified as a corporation, but you can make a check the box election to make it a pass through either disregarded or a partnership if you wanna do the right things. So you're gonna look at those two places, decide that you have a corporation, which means that you're in form 5471 land and on we go. Now that last bullet point, I just wanna to flag to you, A, because it rarely matters but B, when it matters, it matters a lot. A dual chartered entity is, let's say it's the corporate equivalent of a human being that has dual citizenship. So let's say you have a foreign corporation and you know it's a foreign corporation. In the state of Delaware, at least, and that's the only place I've ever done it, maybe other states will allow it too, you can register a foreign corporation there and all of a sudden it gets a Delaware charter. So now it is simultaneously a Bahamas corporation and a Delaware corporation. So I give you the reference here to what to do in the context of a dual chartered entity. A, because it may become important, but B, because I want you to start thinking about that strategy to solve messy problems that you have. Because if you can take a foreign corporation that's got some messes in it, uh, move it to be dual chartered in Delaware, now you've got a domestic corporation, maybe this is going to solve a problem for you. And that's treated as a um, F reorganization, so it's going to be tax free, just some paperwork to do. And sometimes it can help a lot. I've used this in the context of foreign corporations with US real estate holdings that we've needed to fix for some reason. So just giving you a little strategic, you know, hint, maybe look over here. Now, you've got a corporation, do you have a foreign corporation? And foreign just means a corporation that's organized under the laws of anything that's not one of the 50 states or the District of Columbia. Now, we got a foreign corporation, but now you've got special kinds of foreign corporations. You have a specified foreign corporation. This is for categories 1A through 1C. This only matters for the transition tax, section 965. So. If you know that you have one of those beasts where in 20, at the end of 2017, you had to deal with you know, the come to Jesus moment for all the deferred ENP in this corporation, you're going to have a specified foreign corporation. We're going to talk about more on that later. Or you're going to have a controlled foreign corporation. And this is when you have foreign, sharehold, foreign corporations and you've got U.S. shareholders which remember that's the 10% rule that own more than 50%. So controlled foreign corporation is important for category five. Indirectly it's category one as well because a controlled foreign corporation can be a specified foreign corporation. So 
isn't this fun? Even before you've started to prepare a form 5471, you've had to figure out all the meanings of these defined terms in the code and figure out whether your particular client fits within any of those meanings. So here's my slide 18, which gives you an overview of the who and the what. You know, you are a category 1A filer if you are that kind of who, a US shareholder, of what? A specified foreign corporation. And I've given these, you know, the excerpts from the definitions uh, for the, each category all the way down for all nine of them. And you can see that categories 1B, 1C, and 5B, 5C are the same, except for in one, it's a specified foreign corporation, and in five, it's a controlled foreign corporation. And I know in the RevProc and in a bunch of other places, it, they use the initial CFC and SFC, but I love to write it out. I mean, look at 5B. We have a foreign controlled, controlled foreign corporation. Just doesn't that make you laugh? I mean, who, somebody with at least a college degree and possibly a law degree on top of it wrote that. I mean, Seriously, dude, why would you do that? Um, but it's just it's just mockable that we get defined phrases like that in federal law. But I'm not bitter. All right, that's the introduction. Sort of, you see the lay of the land of the defined terms that we're going to be playing with. Now let's start category by category. Category one. It, remember, this is for the transition tax uh, spawned because of Section 965. And so you have to have a U.S. shareholder, remember that's a 10% or more, of specified foreign corporations. The standard definition applies. Um, there's also a time question. You have to own the stock at the end of the year in addition to being a U.S. shareholder sometime during the year. And here is the definition on slide 22 of what's a specified foreign corporation. First things first, a far controlled foreign corporation, or second thing second, any foreign corporation where you have a domestic corporation that's a US shareholder. So in, in the, the games that I play, typically, um, we're going to have humans as shareholders. Sometimes we have complex holding structures, in fact, more often than not. Um, but you know, the, the idea is they're, they're trying to catch, yeah, frankly, for us, the specified foreign corporation has been entrepreneurs abroad who are running normal kinds of corporations and get swept up by Section 965. So it's always been a human, and the question has been whether it's a controlled foreign corporation or not. So that's what we've got going. And I just give you a little um, blurb there to sort of sort out some ambiguity in your head. You know, when, you, when laws like this get first launched at you, it, they'd come at you with a whole bunch of brand new definitions that you've never heard about. Specified foreign corporation in 965, right? And then you start reading along and you'll read I mean, these phrases, deferred foreign income corporation or ENP deficit foreign corporation. What are those? Um, these are just subspecies of what a specified foreign corporation is. So, you know, just, you know, don't worry about it. Um, but the only thing that you need to know for checking the box for category one is, is it a specified foreign corporation? So, Yeah, now let's talk about in a little bit more detail about category one split into categories 1A through 1C. The thing to remember is that category 1A is your new default check the box. So in other words, last year category one is this year category 1A, unless you can force yourself into 1B or 1C. And as it might not surprise you, but category 1A has more schedules to fill in than 1B or 1C. So you have an incentive, if you can, to try and fit yourself into 1B or 1C. Um, that's, that's what's going on. And why did they do this? 
Well, it was because RevProc came along. I mean, the, the, the problem of downward attribution and the mess on Form 5471 erupted right away. And the IRS came out with some sort of hand wavy informal methods for people to handle disclosure requirements when they had no way of getting information. And eventually RevProc 2019-40 was sort of formalizing the hand wavy procedures that the government had during the you know, 2017, 2018, 2019 uh, filing seasons. So that's why they give us some explicit check the boxes. So they've created some clarity here, which is actually a good thing. So category 1A, US shareholder of a specified foreign corporation. That's the same as you know, the old category one. And the only difference is now that you also do not fit into 1B or 1C. And I'm going to have at the end of the presentation, I'm going to roll category one and category five together, deal with RevProc 2019-40 in more detail. So I just want to give you highlights here. So, but the, here's, the, here's the picture and, and look at what's going on here with category 1B and 1C. This is where you've got downward attribution from a foreign person. And you think, first of all, let's talk about the situation where you have a U.S. shareholder owns 100% of a CFC or 75% or something like that. Now, how easy or how hard is it for that person to reasonably get financial data to complete a required form 5471 and whatever schedules are required for that U.S. shareholder? Well, pretty good because they're a direct shareholder, they get control over it, and they can sort of make the corporation do their bidding in theory. But when you have downward attribution from a foreign person, you may not be able to tell even where whether the corporation is a controlled foreign corporation or not, because remember, you have to have 10% shareholders who are US persons um, own at least own more than 50% of that foreign corporation. And if you don't know anything about it, except your 10% slice, and you don't know about any kind of secret behind the door attribution involving foreign persons that you don't even know, how are you going to figure this out? So 1B and 1C are kind of an attempt to find a couple of situations where you, you can show that you know, I don't have full access to all the information, but I've got enough control or sway over the situation where I can get something. So 1B says, I'm a direct owner. See, so section 958A says, you're a US shareholder if you own shares directly or indirectly. Indirectly just means a normal parent sub kind of stack kind of thing. So you've got to, if you're a 95A, 958 open parentheses, little a close parentheses shareholder, you got an economic interest in the corporation, you know, either through a holding company or because you're a direct shareholder. All right. So that implicitly gives you some more sway over what's going on. And then you have the second thing, unrelated. Well, that means we'll see what it means later in the thing, but it, it means that you don't have a strong enough control over that foreign corporation to really make it jump up and sing. And so, yes, you have a direct economic ownership, but you, you can't push buttons and make things happen the way that you could if you were quotes related, close quotes. And foreshadowing quotes related, close quotes means control more than 50%. So that's a place where 1B, they sort of relaxed the information requirements for somebody that goes into that category. Similarly, 1C, look at this. Say, I'm not a direct shareholder or indirect shareholder in that foreign corporation at all. So all my status as a US shareholder, meaning I'm treated as if I own more than 10% of the corporation, is because of constructive ownership from a foreign person. So it's a completely artificial stock ownership relationship because of the attribution rules. But 
they say, well, that's true, but you are related, meaning in terms of the definition of, you know, you have more than 50% control under the Internal Revenue Code 954D. Implicitly, there's some power you wield over this thing. Um, and therefore, we're going to relax the uh, information requirements and the sh schedules that you need to file accordingly. So that's what's going on. And as you'll see when we come to the back end, if you have only constructive ownership in that foreign corporation and you are unrelated, meaning you don't have a more than 50% control as defined in section 954D3, then you don't have to worry about category five at all. So we'll talk about that later. Category two, same as it ever was. I'm going to go briefly through this. Um, this is for U.S. persons who are officers and directors of foreign corporations, and they have a reporting duty to flag to the Internal Revenue Service anytime some other U.S. person, or themselves for that matter, acquires stock in the foreign corporation that triggers certain percentage thresholds. Again, U.S. person, so U.S. person is defined for are you a director or officer, and U.S. person in defined for purposes of are you a stockholder and did you acquire enough stock to trigger the thresholds is slightly different from the normal default definition. We've gotten Puerto Rico residents in certain circumstances, possessions residents in certain circumstances, and Internal Revenue Code 20, uh, 6013 G and H. And this is where non-resident alien spouses make an election to be taxed as residents of the United States. So they will become a U.S. person for this Category 2 filing requirement. And note that it applies to any kind of foreign corporation. It's not just controlled foreign corporations. So someone who goes, you're an officer or director of a foreign corporation. Some U.S. person goes from 0 to 11%. You'll see we have the threshold trigger of 10%. That's a reporting requirement, even if you only have one U.S. shareholder, namely that person who just acquired 11% of the stock. Now, what makes you an officer or director? This is something I've wrestled with for a long time, and I don't know any answer anywhere. So if anybody out there knows what officer or director means for filing purposes, let me know. Uh, my experience has been we studiously avoid naming people as any kind of title if there's any kind of sensitivity whatsoever. So... If meaning if if you're the 100% shareholder of a foreign corporation and you're a U.S. citizen, easy, you know, it's, it's not a big risk to become an officer director because you know what's happening, you know who the shareholders are, and there's not going to be some accidental share transfer behind your back that's going to trigger a Category Two filing requirement. But if there is any possibility that something can happen behind your back triggering a Category 2 filing requirement, and you don't know, and therefore you don't file the Form 5471, you've got problems. So I don't know. I don't think the title per se matters so much as the level of power. And yeah, you can look at the corporate law of every cor um, country where corporation is formed and say, you know, somewhere it'll say a president is someone who has these kind of powers and blah, blah, blah. Eh, why, why do that? You know, and, and I get worried about people who have like very, very minor, 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 minor status as an officer of some kind. So way back in my prior lifetime, I worked for a very, very large bank and I was a vice president. Well, there happened to be 12,000 vice presidents out of the 40,000 plus employees in the bank. So it meant nothing. Um, yet I was an officer, right? Um, it's nuts. And so would, would I, in that situation, someone who had nominally an officer title, but in fact had no power whatsoever, yeah, would I have a category two filing requirement in some obscure way? Possibly. So I'm only saying is 
it's, it's a weird kind of place. Be super careful if you are asked to be an officer or director. Um, and, you know, and then similarly, what happens if you have someone who's, would you like to be chairman? Sure. I got no powers, but I've got the title that may create a risk as well. So watch out for sort of honorary titles to corporations that really put you at risk, but give you no tangible benefit or no tangible protection from risk. Category two is a transaction triggered thing, and it's a 10% threshold kind of deal. So as you're looking at the whole situation, you're going to look for someone who acquires stock in little bits and pieces up to 10%. And as soon as they march past that 10% mark, the filing requirement is triggered. And then, you know, toggle upward every time they reach another 10% threshold. And I, I want you to note here, it's acquisitions only. When we'll see in category three, it's acquisitions or dispositions. So here's, here's my little warning thing for you for an officer. How do you know what's happening? Because what happens if you know who the nominal shareholder is because you've got a, you, you've got a list of the shareholder ledger? What if somebody does a transfer behind your back? Which could happen. You know, I assign the shares to my brother. You know, I assign the shares to my, you know, close friend, Fred, and I don't tell anybody. And I just sort of act as the nominee or agent publicly visible for the true owner behind my back. Stuff like this can create risk for the officer. So that's, that's all there is to it. Um, category two is not a big one in our experience. Um, and usually it's pretty well handled, but it has sort of little marshy, boggy parts of the back 40 acres. You just have to be a little bit wary. Category three, again, it's a transaction triggered filing requirement. When a US person, same modified definition, acquires or disposes of, disposes of stock in a foreign corporation. Same modification, Special rule for Puerto Rico, a special rule for possessions, a special rule for non-resident aliens who make the section 6013 G or H elections. And the acquisitions or dispositions, the not quite mirror image of each other. The acquisitions are the 10% incremental things. The dispositions only matter for reporting purposes when you go from above 10% to below 10%. So for instance, if you're a 25% shareholder and you sell 10% of the stock of the corporation, so now you're a 15% shareholder, that is not a category three transaction that needs to be reported. If you sell 20%, of your 25%, just so you only have 5% left. Now you have dropped below the 10% threshold, and now you do have a category three filing requirement. So you, the shareholder, and category two at the same time, if there's a US shareholder, I mean, a US person who's an officer or director, they're gonna have to report that you did it too. So if you are an officer at, or director, and you were that 25% person who sold 20% and went down to five, you'd be checking box two and box three and reporting away. So there is also a toggle that when you go from non-resident alien to resident alien, that is a category three event. So if you own more than 10% and you immigrate to the United States and become a resident alien, that's a category three filing trigger. So it might just be a one-time thing. You come in and the year that you become a resident alien, you file category three. You might not ever have to file form 5471 ever again, but you will for that year of entry. Here's some other triggers that I've seen over time. First one, non-resident alien family members and constructive ownership rules. So watch out for that. I mean, what happens if through constructive ownership, you can suddenly acquire or de are deemed to acquire more than 10%. Another one is the check the box election. So if you are a 100% shareholder of a foreign corporation 
and you decide that you want to make a check the box election for that foreign corporation and make it a disregarded entity, what has happened? Well, for tax purposes, that's a deemed liquidation of the corporation. So you've gone from owning 100% of the stock of a foreign corporation to being deemed to own the assets of that foreign corporation directly. So that's a disposition of, of stock. And you've gone down below the 10% threshold. Non-resident to resident alien status I've talked about before. Uh, the next one is a really interesting and sort of hidden and obscure, but when it bites you, it bites you bad. You have a U.S. person who marries a non-resident alien, and look what happens. Example, non-resident alien owns 100% of the stock of a foreign corporation, has owned it forever. Meets and marries a U.S. person. The question is, has that U.S. person acquired more than 10% of the stock of that foreign corporation. Well, if you look at the attribution rules, that U.S. person is deemed to constructively own the shares of stock owned by the spouse. So in the year of marriage, that person is deemed to have acquired 100% of the stock of the foreign corporation. So watch out for marriage. Um, I've had a lot of these my experience has been we have been able to file remedial form 5471s years late with a dog ate my homework letter and avoid the penalties. Just saying. Um, reorgs and stock redemptions and all of that. These are all situations where you can see whether through a, a combination of, let's say, stock redemption, all of a sudden you have 5%, but somebody else's stock is redeemed and you are now a 30% owner because you know there's less stock outstanding. Reorgs can also do that. They can be dilutive or or you know, or the whatever the opposite of dilutive is. So your actual stock ownership in the corporation might increase by percentage before or after the reorg. So watch out for situations like that for kind of hidden events that might cause a category three filing requirement. Category four, so who's a category four filer? It's a US person who controls a foreign corporation. So note, we're not using the designation US shareholder, we're just saying US person. We've got this special thing controls and we've got any foreign corporation. We're not talking just about controlled foreign corporations. Incidentally, I believe that you know, from memory, Category 4 is the worstest place to be with the mostest um, schedules and stuff like that to file for Form 5471. So yay. U.S. person. A U.S. person, so this is for Category 4, is again a modified version of Internal Revenue Code Section 7701A30. Again, we have special rules for Puerto Rico possessions and the non-resident aliens who elect to be treated as U.S. residents for income tax purposes along with their U.S. spouses. So here's the, here's the deal for category four. The toggle is with control. U.S. person, you are or you aren't. I mean, that's pretty cut and dried. Foreign corporation exists or doesn't exist. I mean, if it's, if it's not foreign or it's not a corporation, then you don't care anymore. So really, control is the place where all the fuzzy happens. And control means for Category 4, you own stock that's worth more than 50% by vote or value. So, which is kind of interesting. You say, well, if, if a person, one human being, owns more than 50% of the vote or value of a corporation, that person's a U.S. shareholder, right? Because that person possesses more than 10%. And that corporation is also a controlled foreign corporation. But this is the way it's defined for Category 4 purposes. 
So you're watching for the taxpayer that you're preparing this 5471 for, very carefully looking to see if you pass this 50% threshold. And I got to tell you right now, we have one open loop on our desk that we're trying to figure out with a complex holding structure where we're up to about 47 point something percent. And in a complex holding structure where there's a partnership and one person has a profits participation only in a partnership. And we're saying, okay, how do we deal with that by value? So it's a, it's not necessarily an easy question to solve. I'm just saying. It's at an, any time during the year that's controlled. So even a momentary thing will met, will work for you. Pauses to drink coffee. And the more than 50% includes constructive ownership. And this is why spending a lot of quality time with the constructive ownership rules is so important for Form 5471 purposes. And next month we'll go into it in great detail, but the, the, the common sort of approach that they use for constructive ownership rules for 5471 is to import the default constructive ownership rules of section 318 and then slap on special modifications. And you have to usually go to the regs to figure out what those modifications are. There, here are three things that don't matter for category four. And it's important just to remember, because if you're like me, you remember a lot of stuff in your head from prior years and that memory persists and sometimes is wrong because they changed the law. So the question, you know, control more than 50%. Do you have to have stock ownership on the last day of the tax year? Answer no, that's only for categories one and five. Do you have to have that control for 30 straight days? No, it used to be that way, but that law got changed. So now it's at a, the new standard is at any time during the tax year. The final thing, does 958B4, the downward attribution rules, does that matter, the fact that they were repealed? The answer is no, because 958B4 never applied to category four. So its repeal is irrelevant. So here's you know the, the quickie summary. And of, of all of these, I mean, I would certainly spend a lot of quality time making sure that category four in or out is important. I mean, it is is known to you in the best of all possible ways. Um, you know, U.S. person, controlled foreign corporation, uh, pardon me, regular corporation, not a controlled foreign corporation, but you have control and constructive ownership is usually the hardest part of determining control. All right, so let's move on to category five. In category five, I'm going to talk about category five, and then I'm going to finish up by talking about RevProc 2019-40 um, and how it affects both category one and category five, because it works identically in both situations. So the definition, who's a category five filer? This is from the instructions. A U.S. shareholder, so we know what that means, that's the 10% or more, who owns stock in a foreign corporation that is a CFC. So in here we have a controlled foreign corporation at any time during the year, so even momentarily, and who owned that stock on the last day of in that year in which it was a CFC. So it's a, you know, at any time during the year and on the last day, those, those are the triggers. You know, they, they, it's not the time or place here to say, what does, you know, owns that stock on the last day in which the corporation was a controlled foreign corporation. There could be some varieties of situations where that stock, you know, what if you own some different stock? What if you owned, you know, 
Well, you know, remember it's a by voter value. What if you started the year and you had common stock and you ended the year with preferred stock, non-voting, you know, stuff, I mean, we're, people do weird stuff. But that's what a category five filer is. The standard definition of US person applies. So we, we're not going to do the variations for Puerto Rico possessions and people who make the section 6013 elections. So now we've got a US person and we're going to figure out whether that person is a US shareholder. Standard definitions, you know, in direct ownership, indirect ownership, that's 958 open parentheses little a or constructive ownership. And that's the 958B. And the hard work is as usual in the constructive ownership rules. And here is where the downward attribution rules and the repeal of 958B4 are going to matter. And shameless plug for September 24, 2021, noon Pacific time, put it in your calendars. Send me your hardest questions that you want me to include in the presentation ahead of time, and I'll do my best to slot them in. And we'll talk all about constructive ownership, the default rules, as well as the impact of the repeal of 958 before and its aftermath in RevProc 2019-40. So yeah, send me stuff. Email address is going to be on the last slide in the slide deck. So let's talk about RevProc 2019-40 specifically. I'm going to grab some stuff out of the RevProc itself that kind of explain what's going on. And it's the government's explanation of why they did what they did. So here we go. The government realized that in certain circumstances, just because of the repeal of 958 before, and now we've got downward distribute, uh, attribution, it, it wouldn't be easy, and maybe it's impossible, to get data from the corporation just to figure out whether it's a CFC. So the the bottom line question is, I know I'm a, a US person, and let's say I know I own more than 10%, but do I own more than 10% of a CFC? And I can't know that unless I know who all of the other shareholders are. And so if I have the context of a foreign controlled, uh, the downward attribution rules applying, it might be that through some bizarre wrinkle, um, there are some deemed U.S. shareholders that I didn't even know about. And maybe nobody else really thought about it either. So they, they recognize that the basic ability to classify a foreign corporation as a controlled foreign corporation sometimes hampered. And, you know, another thing they mentioned here, you know, in cer certain, certain circumstances, you've got some gross income inclusions, right? Section 951 or section 951 cap A. All right. Now, and that's only happens because all of a sudden the downward attribution rules kick in and you've got these inclusions because you are a US shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation. And how do you even know whether there is income and how to get how much it is and how to get enough detail about the corporation's activities so that you can properly fill in all the schedules that you attach to form 5471. So a legit problem. So what RevProc 2019-40 did was it created two safe harbors, essentially, saying, if you fit into these places, here are your information re uh, reporting requirements. And you look at the table of required schedules on page five of the instructions, and it's less than the default 
reporting requirement for category one or category five. So if you fit yourself there, then we go easy on you. And if you do what's required of you for those categories B and C, then you're not going to run a risk of having uh, 5471 penalties for failure to report all of the nuances that you're supposed to report. Rather than go through the details of everything in RevProc 2019-40, I want to give you this summary table, details next month, and let's just talk through it so you can understand kind of the metaphysical concepts that the government kind of was kind of aiming toward, I think, in RevProc 2019-40. So across the top, you know, it, it says, you know, the the you know, the glory of the two by two matrix, right? Uh, we, first question is stock ownership. So these are the columns and related or unrelated status. Those are the rows. So in the column, look at the first column has direct or indirect stock ownership in the controlled foreign corporation. So you've got this situation where if you have a direct ownership of stock in a controlled foreign corporation, then the implicit assumption that may be redundant is that you've got some leverage to get data and make things happen and satisfy your filing requirements for form 5471. So we're going to treat you, the one with actual stock ownership, differently than someone who only has constructive ownership on the right. So that's the difference. So the, in, in the first column, direct or indirect ownership, that's measured by section 958, open parentheses, little a, for what do you own? Whereas if you only have constructive ownership, that's um, 958B. And so that's, that's where you have constructive ownership of a corporation. And note the important sort of modifier phrase in front of CFC or SFC. It's a foreign controlled controlled foreign corporation or specified foreign corporation. I have some definition slides after this, but the idea here is you've got a foreign corporation that is a controlled foreign corporation only because of these downward attribution rules causing it to be so. So it's not just a generic controlled foreign corporation. It's sort of a special purpose controlled foreign corporation because of 958B4 being gone. So that's, that's the general idea um, and of stock ownership and why they make a distinction in RevProc 2019-40. Now let's look at the rows, related to or unrelated to. This is triggered by section 954-D3. And again, this will be on the following slides. And the idea is, you know, how easy or hard is it for you to get data and satisfy the default filing requirements for form 5471. If you're a related person, the inference is you've got enough clout over this foreign controlled, controlled foreign corporation that you should be able to engineer the data out of them so you can do your form 5471. If you are unrelated to them, the inference is you don't have enough power. You're just sort of at the receiving end of a little hose of data and whatever they give you, they give you because you're not that powerful with respect to that controlled foreign corporation or specified foreign corporation. And so the idea is in that case, maybe we can relax the filing requirements a little bit. So that's, that, that's the reason. Now let's look at the interior of this two by two matrix. So the yellow ones first, these are the special purpose newbie things. So you see first on the second row down, category 1C and 5C. You only have constructive ownership, right? So you have no direct ownership. You only have constructive ownership through somebody else. So you might not even have any economic you know, interest in this thing, you're just deemed to be a shareholder because of the application of section 318A3 attribution rules 
through a foreign person. So that's why you're there. But you have some kind of filing requirement because you're related, see on the far left of that row, to the thing. And related means you have more than 50% control. So I say, well, okay, you're only a constructive ownership, but that constructive ownership gives you greater than 50% leverage over the corporation. So you must be important enough to make things happen. So that's a category one C. All right, this is just me interpreting what's going on in the IRS's head, right? So a reasonable minds may differ, but this is, this is the way I interpret it. And, and then let's look at um, 1B and 5B. Here, you have direct stock ownership in the corporation. Okay, so you, you got some clout, but you're unrelated. You don't have more than 50% under the 954 rules. And therefore, you got some clout, but not all that much. And so we're going to put you in the 1B, 1 and 5B category, where you have to give some data, but maybe it's relaxed a little bit. And you don't have to give the full boat. So if you fit yourself into one of those two yellow highlighted ones, that's where you go and that's what you do. Um, bottom right-hand corner, if you are unrelated, meaning you don't have 958D3 control, more than 50% um, over the foreign corporation, and you have only constructive ownership, it's kind of like you're along as a trailer for the ride. And they say there's no form 54 filing requirement at all. For, so you don't check the box in uh, category five. And then for everybody else, you're in category 1A. That's the default. If you don't fit into the other three boxes, you're into 1A, 5A. So that's kind of how it works. And so what do you do? If you have, I mean, let's, let's move on. Um, I mean, the, the what do you do? I think the short answer is you've got to have an OCD anal retentive level org chart where you know the identities of all the shareholders. And I say that knowing full well, because this is the world I live in, where when I have a foreign corporation with US and foreign owners, the standard answer I get when I ask a question is, well, why do you need to know that? Or worse yet, well, I don't actually know. You know so, yeah, and so but to the best of your ability, get an org chart that's completely full. Um, if you saw the org charts that I use internally, I'm going to have it built out. And then I'm going to have a little picture of a cloud where I don't know what's going on there. And if I have to, I'm going to make unreasonable assumptions to the worst, you know, saying, assume that's a U.S. person um, to make my decisions. So here are the definitions that we're going to use. And I've already talked about them. And, you know, what's a related party, what's a constructive U.S. shareholder and all of that stuff, which is going to be in RevProc 2019-40. All of these rules come out of there. And having said that, um, I've left you with the hardest part of the whole picture, which is dealing with the constructive ownership and attribution rules from Form 5471. But I hope I've sort of given you at least this is where the landmines are and please don't step on them. Um, and next month we'll talk about how to take the teeth out of the landmines if I can mix a metaphor or two. So see you next month. Here's my email address. Send me an email, number one, if you have questions about this month and filing category and how to solve the problem. And second, if you have a question in advance about constructive ownership, indirect ownership, downward attribution rules, all that fun stuff that I can build in and pre-solve an answer for you for next month's session, please send it to me. And with that, I will turn it over and I am done and see you next month.